بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طه ما انزلنا عليك القران لتشقى الا تذكره لمن يخشى اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه خاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى وإن تجهر بالقول فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي والعظيم Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. At the time of the holy beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, a group of companions gathered and were eager to listen to something which gives them excitement or refreshment. The companion of the Prophet Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was there and he asked them, what is it that you are looking? They said, we would like you to tell us or inform us about stories that somehow instill some delight in our hearts, something that gives us ease and tranquility, something that makes us slightly more happier than what we are at the moment. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud informed the Holy Prophet that the Sahaba are looking for some hadith. Hadith in Arabic means something which is told, something which is narrated. So they like something which gives them that kind of joy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse in the Holy Quran due to this particular incident. This verse is verse 23 of chapter 39. The Almighty Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Allahu nazzala ahsan al-hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the best of communication. In other words, this was a message to whom? To those individuals, to the companions who were seeking some kind of uh, alternative conversations or narratives or stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 39 says, this Holy Quran is the best as far as the uh, need of the human being to somehow attain or uh, be illuminated. And if for those who reflect on it, it's truly uh, one that brings them happiness and joy as well as benefit. But the key thing about that ayah, if I want to start the discussion regarding the throne of Allah in this particular session, is very important because the ayah then goes on to say and to describe what is um, the uh, qualities or what, what can be found about the Holy Quran. If I was to bring up the ayah, you would be able to see that the <coughs> this is the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the best speech as uh, the translator of the Quran has translated it as the best announcement now if you go on further towards this particular ayah Allah says kitaban mutashabiha this book is a book which has ambiguous uh, verses yes mathani taqsha'irru minhu julud alladheena yakhshawna rabbahum this Quran is also characteristic in that has verses which despite the fact that seemingly they are repetitive they are not in any shape or form contradictory to each other number one 
And number two, they are in fact talking and discussing another element which many people might not pick on. So apparently it could be something that is often repeated, yeah? but in reality it is quite profound. Why this ayah is important? Because it goes on to say that this Qur'an, what does it do? It's تَقْشَعِرُ مِنْهُ جُلُودُ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ This Qur'an brings into the human beings who indeed exercise the God consciousness and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It brings that kind of um, awe into them when they recite the Qur'an. ثُمَّ تَلِينُ جُلُودُهُمْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ This is very important. And perhaps it is something that we require to ponder upon. The Qur'an says this idea of the remembrance of God, this notion of being conscious of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an is an important prelude. It's a prerequisite. It's a foundation. In fact, the Qur'an itself says it's the best announcement, best communication. But what it does, it softens the heart and it makes the skin, it even talks about the julud, the skin of the human beings, receptive to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine the magnificence and the power of the Qur'an? That not only has it got that spiritual elevation, but it actually impacts your body. The Quran says. And in fact, the Quran also says, That the Quran is a cause of healing and it's mercy for the believers. So what really the, the kind of introduction that we seek to uh, ponder upon from this ayah is the uh, magnificence of the Holy Book. But importantly, of course, as we know, the Holy Quran has a number of verses which are ambiguous, metaphorical. Verses that, as we discussed last time, have an, a possible number of meanings. And therefore, it is absolutely crucial as human beings, as believers, individuals who seek to understand and be illuminated by the Holy Quran, we appreciate the differences between what is muhkam and what is mutashabah. Now, before going into the idea of the throne, and just a little bit of a warning today, it's slightly te technical because of the whole subject of the throne of Allah, the Arsh of Allah, what is it in reality? What is the Almighty talking about when he says here, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa? But I would like to, first of all, discuss this ayah by posing an important question. Why does the Quran have metaphorical verses? Because you and I know the Quran is there for the guidance of mankind. So for many people, it might make more sense if the Quran is entirely muhkam, meaning all the ayat are understood by everyone and the meaning is apparent. Why should there be an ayah that can be understood in a number of ways. What is the philosophy or the ethos or the reason behind the existence of mutashabih verses? Some people have said, the reason why we have mutashabih, and of course, if you go to the beginning of Surah Ali Umran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the notion of the verses of the Quran divided into muhkam and mutashabih, divided into clear and ambiguous. Yet there is an interesting uh, number of theories that have been presented, such as, for instance, some people say it is to demonstrate that seeking righteousness and being of the path of the truth is very, very difficult. So in order for human beings to excel and to reach the highest levels of perfection, they need to work really hard. And hence, there exists ayat which they may not understand at the first level. Some people have suggested that's the possibility. Others have said, no, the reason why there are mutashabih verses is simply the plan of God to ensure there are sects, there are groups and denominations, because they will disagree and say, you know what, this verse means this, and I believe the throne means what I get from DFS, you know, or from furniture shops. What people come to understand is what? The idea that groups and denominations are formed due to the existence of mutashabih verses. And likewise, 
some have suggested that one of the reasons why we have these verses in the Quran is so that Allah is inviting us to use other tools like the Arabic language, like other disciplines and sciences, like usul al-fiqh, the, the science of the jurisprudence, you know, principles of jurisprudence. So there's these kind of ideas presented. But Allama Tabatabai in Al-Mizan, this is what he says about these three theories. You know the three that I've just mentioned? This is what he says. He says, Sakhifatun Zahiratu Sakhafa. He says, This is silly and stupid as any anything that is apparent. He uses very strong terms to say, How can you say there are verses which are metaphorical and therefore the creation of sects? or for the usage of the Arabic language, or for the idea of making it hard to get that reward. Instead, he proposes three very beautiful possible meanings or reasons why we have verses like this, number five in chapter 20, Surah Taha. Why do we have uh, surah, uh, uh, verses like this? He says the first thing is, one of the fundamentals of the religion of Islam and an idea that is drilled into our minds in the Holy Quran is the principle of taslim, submission. That when the human being recognizes that they are a mortal, possible existent, and there is a necessary existent, wajibul wujud, who is the creator of everything, and they, the human beings, are subservient to that absolute perfect being, and they recognize that reality, it creates that servitude and the master relationship. And when an individual picks up the Holy Quran and finds these unbelievably mesmerizing words, recognizes this is from the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not normally wor normal words of the human beings. They don't use these type of terminology. In other words, there is some kind of richness in it. He says, the notion of submission is quite clearly established when you reflect upon mutashabih verses. When you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed it there and you and I must submit to the reality that it's there. Yes? Number one. But he also says it's not only because of this. He points to the importance of the usage of the intellect, the aql, and how many verses in the Quran invite human beings to reflect, to ponder, to contemplate. Yes? Allah says, do they not reflect upon the Holy Quran? Or are their hearts sealed? Yes? So what is interesting is that the notion of the uh, of the mutashabi uh, is to invite human beings simply not to sit there and become idle. Just to take these verses and say, you know what? Whatever it's there, it's there. But to utilize this magnificent tool and this creation that God the Almighty says was the first that I created for the human being. Yes, the first thing he created was the intellect, the aql, according to the hadith at the beginning of the book of intellect in Usul al-Kafi, yes, whereby we are told that al-aql was what? Was the first creation of God. But the key thing here is whether human beings are able to utilize their intellect to reflect upon the Holy Quran. And the third reason for the existence of mutashabih verses is the importance of the following of God's representatives. Scholars say here, if the Quran entirely does not need interpretation, if it was as clear as, for instance, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Yes? You would not necessarily feel the need to refer back to the Prophet and the Imams, peace be upon them. So there is a wisdom in their presence so that we have this connection, this relationship with those honorable and holy individuals that were indeed chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we come to this ayah, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. In the Holy Quran, the word Arsh has been used 22 times. Okay, 22 times the word Arsh is used. And what you find is essentially it is used in reference to the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala except in two occasions. 
The first occasion that is in reference to uh, the throne of a human being is in chapter Surah An-Naml, verse number 33, uh, whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the story of Bilqis, you know, the queen of Sheba. And Allah says, وَأُوتِيَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَلَهَا عَرْشٌ عَظِيمٌ She has been given so many things and she has a huge throne. And in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 100 says, وَرَفَعَ أَبَوَيْهِ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, Yusuf raised his parents onto the throne. Okay? So these are two occasions where the word arsh is used, not in reference to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rest of the times, the 20 other occasions, is in reference to Arshullah. Of course, there are derivatives here. Uh, that's why it says 30 for the word Arsh, when you search the word Arsh, because as you see in the first ayah, in Surah Al-Baqarah 259, it talks about the uh, story of Uzair, where he came to uh, a village or a city and he saw it completely destroyed. Yeah, and wondered, how will Allah bring these people back to life. And the key thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا Now, what is the word Arsh in Arabic? Very important that we understand the lexical background of the word. If you look to, for instance, one of the most important books in Arabic uh, lexography, Al-Raghib, for uh, the author of, uh, of which is Al-Isfahani, uh, he, this, this uh, book is known as uh, Al-Mufradat Al-Raghib or Raghib Al-Mufradat. This particular individual, he, he says, Al-Arsh in Arabic means whatever covers something. Shay'un Musaqqaf. Yeah, so Arsh is the covering. And the Quran uses it that way. وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا means that everything is destroyed and whatever covers it is on top of it. You know, when a building is destroyed, the ceiling and everything at the top collapses right at the bottom, yes? So the Quran says the whole village is destroyed and it's, it's covered by the, the kind of upper layer of the building and the ceilings of the building. So Urush comes from Arsh, which means that element, the covering of a building or a room or any particular construction. Yet, of course, the Quran also uses the word Arsh as it's used in the Arabic language to denote throne, which normally people of power and majesty uh, sit on, a physical entity. Now, here we have an important notion before I give you four opinions, mainstream opinions of what Arsh is according to the uh, Muslim th uh, commentators of the Quran regarding Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. But before um, I do that, I want to very briefly explain to you a concept regarding the attributes of God so that we understand it before we talk about these four attributes, uh, four theories. <coughs> I don't know if everyone can see this uh, notion here. This is the, the idea of anthropomorphism. I'm not sure if we discussed this in earlier sessions. But it's the attribution of physical characteristics to certain beings. And in this regard, it is the um, placing of human features to God, the Almighty. Yeah? And in Arabic, it's known as at tashbih or at tajseem. Tajseem means to give a body, yes, to give body features to God the Almighty. And this has been a matter of huge problem and a contentious issue amongst the theologians, amongst the mufassireen for centuries, uh, as influenced by. Uh, Christian thought and Jewish texts and so on which believe in this concept quite firmly and it's an established notion that yes God does have some physical characteristics and uh, 
it is something that is fairly uh, well documented in those kind of texts. Yet, when we talk about the attributes of God, we divide the attributes of God to the following. Uh, in Imami theology, in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we talk about the attributes of God by saying the attributes of God There are the attributes of the essence, adhatiya, and there's the attributes of action, alfa'liya, and there is the negative attributes, asilbiya. I don't know if everyone can see that. Okay. Now, the the. Attributes of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is a fascinating area which I don't want to delve into, but perhaps inshallah, if you go through uh, Islamic theological discourses, you'll end up discussing this, uh, especially in the areas to do with Tawheed. The attributes of the essence of God and the attributes of actions of God make up the majority of Sifat. Yes, so we're talking about the Sifat, Al Sifat. But the intriguing one, so I don't want to talk about these and our belief about the fact that the attributes of God are part of his essence and the attributes of God which are primarily the dhatiya are the ilm, al-qudra, um, uh, for instance you have al-hayat, al-hikmah and so on, hikmah could be action. Anyway, what I want to really just talk about for a, uh, a, a short while is this notion the negative attributes. The first thing that comes to your mind is, how can God have negative attributes? Negative here does not mean how you and I perceive it, the opposite of positive. Essentially, it denotes to the idea that anything that does not befit God cannot be one that we describe God. So, it is the notion of tanzi, meaning, the idea of distancing God the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from that which is not Him, from that which cannot be Him, from that which He cannot be described. That's why He Himself says in the Quran, Subhanallah Amma Yasifun. They describe God through many different ways, but Allah is exalted above that. Except what he has chosen for himself in the Quran and he has taught his chosen servants. Okay? So, for instance, if an individual says, Allahul Muhtaj, Allah is in need, we say that what? Allah is not in need. That not in need is one of the sifat which are known as the negative attributes. And when we come to the notion of anthropomorphism, we have a major problem in Islamic theology in many schools of thought, and one that has posed, uh, caused a very uh, challenging um, uh, time for many of the scholars when it comes to dealing with this. But let's go through the theories anyway, and maybe we can um, discuss this later. The first um, school of thought that comes out with the understanding of what does it mean when it comes to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and the notion of the throne is the Ash'arites. Now who are Ash'arites? Ash'arites were formed in the uh, early uh, um, fourth century or towards the end of the third Hijri century, yeah? And they were, either as a result of a conflict regarding the notion of whether the Word of God, the Qur'an, is created or not. Yes, whether it is something, as a Word of God, did it always exist, or did God the Almighty create it? And of course, there was before them the Mu'tazilites, and the founder of the Ash'arite school of thought, Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari, he was a Mu'tazilite, 
became an Ash'arite and he founded this particular theological school of thought. His teacher was uh, Sheikh Abu Ali Jaba'i. Now, the key thing is majority of our brothers, the Ahl Sunnah today are Ash'arites. That's why we mention it. The vast, vast majority are Ash'arites. Yeah? And their aqidah, their theology is based on Ash'arites. Likewise, when we look at the four schools of thought, non-Imami schools of thought, the Hanbalites, the Shafi'ites, the Hanafites, and the Malikites, yeah? these four are predominantly jurisprudential. They're mostly concerned with fiqh. They have somehow evolved to involve more theological discussions, but essentially you can have a Hanbalite who's a Ash'arite. You can have a Maliki who is a Mu'tazilite, and so on, yes? The Imami school of thought combines the fiqh and the theology from one source, because we believe it's from the Imams. Whereas the four Imams of the four schools of thought predominantly focused on jurisprudence and fiqh. And later, there were these discussions to do with aqidah and theology. In any case, the Ash'arites, this is very important and perhaps it will be useful for us when we discuss this, uh, when you think about this in, in the future, is the Ash'arites, the first thing they said, one of the first things they came up with is this notion known as Bila Kayfiyya. Bila Kayfiyya is what? That they would want to be different to the Mu'tazilites, so they would come and say, Allah can be seen, but we don't know how. Bila Kayf. Allah has a body, but we don't know how. Bila Kayf. So they stuck this Bila Kayf conveniently to anything which they wanted to believe. They said, well, we don't know. Yes? Seemingly in this verse, he is sitting on a throne, they say. But we don't know what this throne is. But there is a throne, and he sits on it. But we don't know how. Bila Kayf. This is known as Bila Kayfiyya. And they... Uh, propagated this a lot, you know, and uh, it, it began to be accepted um, th throughout the times. They say the Arsh is unknown, it is mutashabah, so it is ambiguous, but we don't know its reality. Yeah? It's a very interesting uh, hadith narrated by many Mufassireen that Malik ibn Anas, who is the founder of the Maliki school of thought, one day was visited by somebody. Someone asked him this question. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Kayf istawa? Ar-Rahman, Allah, somehow, as they say, has this istiwa on the Arsh. How did he have this particular grip or sitting or whatever they interpret it on the throne? And the narration said to us that Malik was silent for a while. Then he became angry and started to you know, have sweat, yeah? He started sweating. Then he looked at him and said this. He says, Huwa stawa, wa la na'arifu kayfa stawa. He definitely sat, but I don't know how he sat. Don't ask, why are you asking how he sat? I know he sat, huwa stawa, yes? Or whatever he meant by stawa, yeah? And then this man would not take no for an answer, yes? He would say to him, but how? So Malik would say, Inni la I think you're, uh, you know, you've become deviant, get out. You know, don't, don't ask questions. And sometimes what happens is we've developed that, unfortunately, tendency to see if people are asking quite a few questions, we may think that that may be uh, a weakness in their faith or that they're doubting. Whereas on the contrary, we encourage people to ask questions if they're sincere in learning. Because I remember a few weeks ago, a sister came to visit here, yeah, a French sister who's embraced Islam and last year, and she had a lot of questions. She went to one of these mosques, one of the sisters, you know, who teaches her, yes, uh, Islam. She said, I had a lot of questions, and I asked her. I said to her, can you answer these questions for me? So this new convert, revert sister says that that teacher said to her, I don't like your questions. Your questions are leading towards my concern that you are going to leave Islam. You're asking too many questions. You should just believe. Don't ask. Yeah? And this is what happens when you have limited 
uh, scope of understanding and certainly the resources and as well as how Quran is perceived is very much one-sided so to speak it's not open yeah so that's the first kind of theory or the first school of thought the Ash'arites then you have the Salafi the Salafis they believe it's definitely a physical throne it's a throne yeah they believe it has pillars over the seven heavens so proper pillars yeah it's very big Allah sits on it and on Thursday nights he comes down or to the second heaven and invites people for forgiveness then returns okay so they believe it's actually a physical entity where the Almighty sits on it and has to uh, make these journeys and the proof for this is actually in Majma al Fatawi li Ibn Taymiyyah page 374 so I'm not going to make a claim without the references uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says in Muhammadan he says the Prophet Allah sits the Prophet next to him where on the Arsh on the throne then he says إذا, then he says إذا جلس الله على الكرسي, when Allah sits on the Kursi now he's talking about the chair the Kursi yeah you will hear a voice of screaming just like how an animal screams when you put on it heavy weight yeah so and basically the, the they support this belief with a narration that is found in uh, Sahih Bukhari we mentioned this a uh, few narrations last week but i give you a different narration in book of adhan chapter fadl sujood pay, uh, page uh, or hadith number 764 uh, it says on the day of judgment allah will say wayhaka ya ibn adam o the son of adam woe be to you did i not take this covenant from you that you will not worship anyone except me Fayaqul, the human being responds, Ya Rabbi, la taj'anni ashqa khalqik. Oh Allah, don't make me of the worst of your creation. Then the narration in Bukhari says, Fayadhakullahu azza wa jal. Allah will then laugh. Okay, Allah will then laugh. Thumma ya'dhanu lahu biddukhuli fi jannah. Then he gives permission for him to be entered into jannah. So they say, if God laughs, he has to have a face. Last week we talked about the narration that says he puts his leg in Jahannam, so he must have a leg. There is an ayah that says he puts his hands over the people, so he must have a hand. Yeah? But again, they, they, they try to uh, distance themselves from giving it some kind of features. But they say it's definitely a hand, it's definitely a throne, it's definitely a face, so to speak. Okay? <clears throat> then there's the third theory, or the third understanding of Al-Arsh, which is now possibly not being followed by m most people. In other words, it was there, it was accepted at a time period, but it was rejected later. And this is based on the idea that there are nine spheres. Yes? So there are the seven heavens, then there's the kursi, then there's the arsh. So there's the chair of God, then there's the throne of God. But they say, of course, this throne and kursi does not refer to anything physical, but more so as something which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it exists in these so-called nine layers. The seven heavens and the kursi and the arsh. But it seems to be based upon conjecture. Not on riwayat of the, uh, riwayat, uh, of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt or in fact any verses of the Quran. And that's why it has lost any kind of followers and momentum and fairly been rejected. The fourth understanding of Al-Arsh is this. That of course it's mutashabih, of course it's ambiguous and it does not in any shape or form refer to a physical entity because Allah says Laysa kamithlihi shay and Al Quran Yufasiru Ba'dahu Ba'da. The Quran interprets one the other. And when the Quran says there is nothing like him, there is absolutely no way of attributing physical characteristics to God. So they say 
essentially what it is, it refers to the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. He encompasses everything. He is the all-powerful, almighty. Yeah? They say istiwa in Arabic, no Arab scholar has ever said istiwa means to sit. They say al-istiwa yani al-istila. Istila means to be in control. Yeah? So when Allah says he somehow has this istiwa on the arsh, that means uh, he is on, in control of everything. And al-arsh is a metaphorical reference to all of the creation. Yeah? He does not miss anything. And everything is in his hands. Just like how they say a king, when they sit on a throne, they normally demonstrate their power and their might. And when Allah says that he has this istiwa on the arsh, that means there is nothing that he misses. Everything is part of his great kingdom. Look at the number of verses in the Holy Quran that talk about arsh. And they say, if you look at, for instance, uh, Surah Yunus, this one. <clears throat> this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna rabbakum Allahu alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal ard fi sittati ayyam. Six periods, not days, the creation occurred. Thumma istawa ala al-arsh. So they say, you know, the usage of the word arsh comes after creation, which means what? It's everything that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ Like the, the other verse in Surah Taha. الرَّحْمَانُ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ اسْتَوَى So they say here, that means he's in control. That means he runs the affairs. Everything is in his hands. Unlike what the Quran says, the Jews say, يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ the Quran says, it says that there are some Jews that said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world, then he left it. And his hands are tied. Yes. Whereas they say, the, the scholars, Mufassireen, the ulama, the Islamic theologians, they say, no, this verse and many others that talk about Arsh highlights what? It highlights the all-encompassing power and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That after creation, everything in his, is in his control. However, one of the most beautiful things about the Qur'an is that there's always scope, isn't it, to try and dig deeper and delve into the many oceans that human beings can be illuminated. And therefore, there is a fifth opinion. All right? And this fifth opinion has been accepted or, or uh, referred to by recent mufassireen of the Qur'an. Yeah? So you have, for instance, Sheikh Subhani, Allama Tabatabai, and others are of the opinion that Arsh means the following. <clears throat> they say, it's all very good saying it's metaphorical. It's all nice saying it's not really something. But they say, you know, if you go back to the verses that talk about the Arsh, not all of them talk about creation. Yeah? So, let's have a look at a few. Here. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ Allah is referring to a throne which is great. There is no uh, reference in, in this regard when it comes to creation. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ And you find these... Uh, References to Arsh in isolation. So, for instance, you look at here, this ayah, that you see the angels, let's have a look at the translation, you see the angels circumambulating around the throne of God, glorifying Him. So, they're circumambulating around what? His creation? Yes? Then they are posing these questions. There is a very interesting verse here in chapter 40. Allah says, Alladina yahmilun al arsh. Those who carry the throne. 
Something is being carried. Although Shakir here says, bear the power. Okay? Um, and many other verses which point to this. And of course, this is probably the most fascinating one. وَالْمَلَكُ عَلَىٰ أَرْجَائِهَا وَيَحْمِلُ عَرْشَ رَبِّكَ فَوْقَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ ثَمَانِيَةٍ There will be eight who on that day will carry the throne of God. Can you see why people have adopted or attempted to understand the throne as a physical entity? These verses somehow allude to that, don't they? That there is some kind of carrying involved. And there's a number here. There's a number eight that is being referred to in the Holy Quran. So, they say we have to refer to the riwayat, to the narrations. And when we group the narrations that talk about arsh, there is a, an important notion that emerges for us. A picture that is demystified and clarified for us. And that is what, this is why I need your attention, slightly sensitive. They believe that al-arsh lahu wujudun khariji, meaning arsh has a reality, external reality, yes? They say it is haqiqatun mawjuda. It's an existent that is real. Something. It is something. Okay? It is not a matter to be taken metaphorical, but it is something. It's a haqiqah. See, all these verses, and Allah says it's a great arsh. Arshun azim. Yes? But what is this thing? They come to the riwayat and they conclude the following. They say that in every, if we look at it figuratively, in every country or in every society, there is a place, there is a center that is the center of intelligence and organizes everything and runs everything. It's like the headquarters. Yeah? So, the idea of Arsh is presented to be a creation of Allah which encompasses the knowledge. It is all about the knowledge of God related to His creation before they are created and after they are created and has the rules of the administration and the measures of creation. It's a center for the running of the creation. Essentially, because Amir al-Mu'mineen salam and the Imam were asked, what is Arshullah? They respond back by saying, huwa ilmullah. So some of the riwayat say it's the knowledge of God. Yes, but if you delve further, you come to the understanding that this knowledge, how is it manifested? It's ma manifested in a particular way, in an existence which runs the creation of God. Now, you might ask, and you should ask, why should there be a existence that runs things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He's the one who runs things, yes? I pose the question to you, why should there be angels that take the lives of human beings away? Allah takes, He says in the Quran, Allah takes the soul of the believers, yet He also says, or the souls of human beings, yet He also says that there is an angel of death. There is an angel of death that does this particular task. So, the Mufassirin, they say, you must pay attention to an ayah, which is what in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, which gives us the strongest clue about the reality of Al-Arsh. Here, this ayah is very, very important. Allah inna rabbakum Allahu alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal-ard fi sittati ayyam thumma stawa ala al-arsh Fine, everything so far is okay Yudabbiru al-amr Here's the thing Everything is organized Everything is run meticulously, carefully through the arsh But the next part, Allama Tabatabai says that's the key to unlock the possible secret. 
He says, ما من شفيع إلا من بعد إذنه. Here, I would like your attention because the word shafi is used. Shafi is what? Intercession. Yes. And normally we talk about the shafa'a of the imams, the shafa'a of the prophets. They yeah. argue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything through means. And this is the one of the wisdoms of God. That his plan is that everything is done through processes. So for instance, if we want to plant a tree, if we want to have a tree, we need to plant the seeds and wait. It needs to go through a process. Yeah. Likewise, for children, they need to go through babies, nine months in the womb of their mother. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, you know, at that, that moment, immediately the creation happens and the child is born. But things go through processes, asbab. Yeah? So Allah wa ta'ala has instigated this cause and effect system in our lives. Everything is through a cause and we see the effect of it. And out of his wisdom, it is possible that there is this center of knowledge, the center of tadbir, the center of running of the universe, which has the knowledge of God and Allah is in control of it. And this center ensures the smooth running of the creation of God. Don't please think about the center like a building. It's not a physical entity we are talking about. But does it have an existence? Some of the scholars says yes, it has an existence. It's not a metaphorical reference. It has some kind of an existence. That's why there is this word shafi'ah. Because what? Through it, things happen. And it's through Allah's commands. مَا مِنْ شَفِيعٍ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِذْنِهِ Now, let's have a look very briefly at the narrations that talk about Arsh. Some of them are truly beautiful. And in, in fact, some have uh, relevance onto our lives, not just a theological concept or a matter of understanding of the word Arsh in the Holy Quran. But if you go, for instance, to, to the uh, book uh, Tawheed al-Saduq, he uh, narrates from Salman al-Muhammadi al-Farisi that there was a Christian scholar who asked Imam Ali salam and said to him, can you tell me more about the throne? And Imam Ali salam says, Inna al-mala'ika tahmilu al-arsh. The mala'ika are carriers of this throne. So now you begin to understand if this throne is the center whereby there is the knowledge about the creation past, before, and so on, the malaika have been given access to this. So carriers here means they are equipped with that knowledge. They are part of this process. In other words, we have angels for the wind, we have angels for life, we have angels for rain, we have angels for death. So this all is part of the process of what? Of the arsh, what happens in the arsh. So when the Quran says, al malaika carry the arsh, it means they have the knowledge that is within the arsh. Yeah? So Imam says, Inna al malaika tahmil al arsh. And then he says, Walaysa al arsh kama tadun kahayat al sarir. Arsh is not what you think, like a bed or some wooden structure. Walakinahu shayun mahdudun makhlukun mudabbir. But the arsh is something which is what? Which is existent. Yes? created and it's important in the running of affairs and Allah is the owner of it okay Imam al-Sadiq when he asked what is Arsh he says it is the knowledge of how things work so this could be part of the function of the arsh, how things run, yeah? And there's a beautiful hadith in Man la yahdharuhu al from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, and please focus on this hadith, this is a beautiful hadith, uh, that he, peace and blessings be upon him, was asked, why is the Kaaba called the Kaaba? What's the reason behind it being called the Kaaba? He says, لِأَنَّهَا مُرَبَّعَةً Because it's a cube. Yes, 
It's a cubical structure. فَقِيلَ لَهُ وَلِمَا صَارَتْ مُرَبَّعًا Okay, why did Allah make it a cube? He said, لِأَنَّهَا بِحِذَاءِ الْبَيْتِ الْمَعْمُورِ Because it's underneath the house which is known as Baytul Ma'mur. Perpendicular above the Kaaba is what is known as Baytul Ma'mur, which is a house of God for the Malaika that circumambulate according to the Rariyat. وَهُوَ مُرَبَّعْ And the Baytul Ma'mur is also cube, cubical. فَقِيلَ لَهُ وَلِمَ صَارْ بَيْتُ الْمَعْمُورِ مُرَبَّعًا Why is this Baytul Ma'mur cubical? He responds, لِأَنَّهُ بِحِذَاءِ الْعَرْشِ وَهُوَ مُرَبَّعْ Because Baytul Ma'mur is under the throne of God and it is cubical. So he was asked, why is the throne cubical? He says, لِأَنَّ الْكَلِمَاتِ الَّتِي بُنِيَ عَلَيْهَا الْإِسْلَامُ أَرْبَعْ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ He was asked, why is the throne cubical? He says, because the words that Islam was founded upon is سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ And these are the four foundations of the throne, not physical. Not physical. Because you don't, can't have a, these are words, these are expressions, these are exaltations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And it shows this, uh, the significance of this, these words. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Because the first is known as al-taqdis. Yes? The second is al-thana. So taqdis, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, is to show great gratitude and thankfulness. The third is tanzih, to exalt and the fourth is At-Tawheed Al-A'zam Wallahu Akbar That is the ultimate monotheism Yeah Now, just to mention one error, one mistake that often we make and I've pointed it to my brothers and sisters of certain satellite channels, Shia satellite channels and others when they make this mistake, when they put on the Adhan Yeah And when we translate the, the sentence Allahu Akbar Often, how is it translated? God is great, isn't it? Yeah. Or some people put it as God is the greatest. Imam al-Sadiq says both are wrong. They cannot be described in such a way. Why? He says when you say God is great or greatest, you are in effect placing God on a scale with his creation. You're comparing the Creator with His creation. And that is not possible. Because you're saying, okay, fine, you could say it's whatever, million, billion, whatever times higher, but it's still comparison. He says, Allahu Akbaru min an yusaf. Allah is greater than being attributed with anything that people have attributed. So he's greater, he's bigger than being given people's attributes or attributes that he has not given himself. Yeah? Now, here's the thing. This verse in the Quran that says, because I want to wrap the subject of Arsh, it's very intriguing and time is over, but I want to answer some of these key, key issues about some of the ayat in the Quran. Remember the verse that says that on the day of judgment, there will be eight who will carry the throne, yes? This particular verse is in chapter 69, verse number 17. ثمانية, and there are narrations that say these are angels, but there are other narrations that say حَمَلَةُ الْعَرْشِ ثَمَانِيَةُ أَرْبَعَةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَأَرْبَعَةٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ There are four from the beginning and four from the end. From the beginning, they are Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. And from the end, in other words, the end of the people who are representative of God, the Holy Prophet, Amir al-Mu'mineen, al-Hasan, wal Hussein. Peace and blessings be upon them. So this narration exists. Now, what does this mean? They carry the throne of God. They're being given special access to the knowledge of God. That's what it means. Yeah? 
So more than any other human being, these eight have this knowledge from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah of course knows best. Therefore, in conclusion, the method of the Ahl al-Bayt in understanding metaphorical ambiguous verses is to refer the ambiguous to the muhkam, to the clear verses, and to of course understand it using the narrations from those who have been placed next to the Quran and Hadith al thaqalain or al thaqlain inni tarikum fikum al thaqalain kitab Allah wa atrati ahl bayti why because laysa kamithlihi shay there is nothing like him and therefore he is exonerated from any physical attributes or anything which limits him we denounce anthropomorphism because God is the creator of space and time cannot be limited because a limited being can be divided and a divided being will be annihilated. This is a basic summary of philosophical arguments that a, a, a being which can be limited to a space or time is divisible and a being which is divisible cannot be omnipotent, eternal, has no beginning and no end. Okay? And the Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, at the end, he says, مَنْ زَعَمَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَوْ فِي شَيْءٍ أَوْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ فَقَدْ أَشْرَكَ Whomsoever claims that Allah comes from something, or what? Or is in something, or is on something, they have committed shirk. If they are referring to, of course, the notion of physical attributes. The final uh, point I would like to mention is, of course, there are many riwayat that talk about the greatness of the Arsh of Allah outside the discussion of what Arsh is, such as, for instance, we are told in Ziyarat al-Jami' al-Kabira, the Ziyarat that talks about the excellence of the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum as-salam, جَعَلَكُمُ اللَّهُ أَنْوَارًا خَلَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ أَنْوَارًا فَجَعَلَكُمْ بِعَرْشِهِ مُحْدِقِينَ Allah created you lights which circumambulate around his arsh. Yeah? And we have the famous narration, the Sunni and Shia narrators present, and that is, it is written on the arsh, إِنَّ الْحُسَيْنَ مِسْبَاحُ الْهُدَى وَسَفِينَةُ النَّجَاتِ That Hussein is the lantern of guidance and the ship of salvation. Yes? We also find narrations uh, about what shakes the throne of Allah. What shakes the throne of Allah, yes? In particular, as an example, number one, when there's divorce. أَبْغَضُ الْحَلَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ When there's divorce, the throne of Allah shakes. Again, try not to think of it physically, yes? And secondly, when there is an orphan that cries and is mistreated because of the lack of protection, nourishment, and overall well-being. When there's any orphan who is in distress, that's why the Quran says, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ Do not hurt the orphan. The narrations tell us that an orphan that cries and is what? And mistreated or not looked after, this shakes the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Insha'Allah we can discuss the rest of the verses in Surah Taha next time. وآخر الأعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيد المرسلين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين